Okay, can you see uh, my screen, particularly the uh, PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, it looks good, Dan. Also, um, the participants won't be able to speak. So um, I just, if they have questions, if they could raise their hand um, and then we can unmute them or um, they can just drop their questions in the Q&A. Okay, thank you. That sounds good. All right, so this is a workshop today on the implied warranty of habitability. Uh, the first thing we should do is talk about what is the implied warranty of habitability. Um, it's an implied warranty in every residential lease in California that uh, requires your landlord to keep your residence in a tenable condition. Um, it's important to know also that it's not waivable, even if it's not specifically written in the lease, um, it still applies to every single lease. And if there's a clause in the lease that waives it, it says, you know, the tenant is responsible for keeping their their apartment or their home uh, habitable, uh, that's not enforceable. Uh, that that part of the lease is, is void. Uh, so where does this warranty come from? It comes from California Civil Code Section 1941, um, which just says that your landlord is required to keep your residence tenable. So what makes a unit untenable? The statute um, lists a lot of very specific conditions that the landlord is required to to address if they come up uh if any of these exi conditions exist then under the statute your unit is not tenable so let's go through through the through the conditions i've listed them here in the slides uh so the first thing is a effective waterproofing uh means exterior walls roof doors uh windows must be waterproof. Uh, so if you have leaks coming in through the roof or the doors or the windows, that's a habitability issue that your landlord needs to address. Uh, plumbing and gas facilities maintain a good working order. So if, th if there's leaks, um, plumbing leaks, flooding, things like that. Uh, gas leaks, if you smell gas in your house, those are habitability issues. In California, you are also entitled to hot and cold running water. Uh, through appropriate fixtures. Uh, we see a lot of times that people don't have hot water and the landlords don't think that's required, but it is. Um, you also need to be connected to the sewage system. Um, heating facilities maintained in good working order. Uh, so you need to have heat in California. Air conditioning is not, is not covered, however. So if you don't have air conditioning or your air conditioner is broken, that is not necessarily a habitability issue in California. Uh, electrical Electrical lighting uh, needs to be maintained in good working order. That means that you know your your residence needs to have lights built in, and they need to be working. Uh, an adequate number of trash receptacles. Uh, so outside of your outside of your house or unit, there needs to be appropriate trash receptacles that are kept clean uh, in good condition. Other things: um, the building, the grounds, the appurt appurtenances uh, need to be clean, sanitary, and free from accumulation of debris, filth, rubbish, garbage, rodents, and vermin at the start of the lease. So when you move in, um, it needs to be in that condition, all areas. Um, and then the common areas, the areas that are under control of the lease, this standard applies to those areas uh, for the duration of the lease. So you have a courtyard or say the trash areas like we talked about, the driveways, parking spaces, they need to uh, meet this standard uh, throughout the lease. Uh, floors, stairways, and railings uh, need to be maintained in good repair. Uh, and, and in a residential hotel, a uh, landlord must also provide locking separate mailbox for each tenant. Um, And then if you look at the statute 1941, it incorporates two health and safety code sections, 17920.3 and 17920.10. Um, so let's look at what's included uh, in those because those are also part of the warranty of habitability. Some of them are duplicative of the conditions we already listed. So I left those out, um, but these are other conditions so that, that need to be uh, in place uh, to have a habitable unit. So 
a uh, lack or a lack of or improper bathroom, bathtub, or shower, a lack of or improper kitchen sink, lack of or improper ventilation equipment, lack of or minimal amounts of natural light and ventilation, uh, room space and dimensions less than required by code, dampness of habitable rooms, uh, infestation of insects, vermin, uh, rodents, as determined by a health officer or code enforcement, visible mold growth, as determined by a health officer or code enforcement, other general dilapidation or improper maintenance. So that's a very broad uh, requirement right there, as you can as you can guess by the language. So a lot of things could fall under general dilapidation. So if you think that something in your uh, home meets that requirement that's something you would you would want to talk to your attorney about um lack of connection to the sewage system lack of garbage and storage uh, storage and removal facilities uh, deteriorated or inadequate foundations uh, defective or deteriorated floor or floor supports or floors that can safely impose safely support the imposed loads and that those standards for the floor also apply to the walls. Um, if they can't support the loads, if they lean, if they buckle, uh, they split. Same with the ceilings um, and, and fireplaces as well. Uh, and then health and safety code section 17920.10 um, is about lead contamination. So it's not necessarily a problem if, if your apartment or your home is painted with lead-based paint. However, if it starts deteriorating, if it's chipping off, that is a problem. Uh, if there's dust coming from it that may be contaminated with lead, or if it's contaminating the soil. Um, so th those are habitability issues as well. And then disturbing lead-based lead paint without containment. So if you have lead-based paint and they start doing work, um, you know they need to take the proper safety measures to contain Contain the lead that's being shed by the paint. So when does a landlord not have a duty to repair? So when you have these conditions, um, you know, as I said before, it's on your, it's your landlord's duty to fix them. Uh, however, the landlord is not required to, to fix them if the tenant is in violation of any of the following obligations. Uh, we'll talk about that. And the tenant's violation of the obligation substantially contributes to the existence of the dilapidation or substantially interferes with, interferes with the landlord's abilities to affect repairs. So what are the obligations that you have? Um, you need to keep the property that the tenant occupies as clean and sanitary as possible. Uh, you need to dispose from your unit, garbage, and other waste in a clean and sanitary manner. Properly use all electrical gas plumbing fixtures and keep them as clean and sanitary as possible. Um, not to permit in any person, including the tenant themselves, uh, on the property with the tenant's permission to willfully or wantonly destroy, deface, damage, impair, or remove part of the structure or dwelling. Um, and you need to use the portions of the dwelling for their intended purposes. So basically, that means if you have a habitability issue and you caused it or one of your guests caused the, the issue because you're not keeping, keeping the place clean, uh, you're not throwing your trash away, you know, that could lead to um, infestations, things like that. Or if you have some type of problem because you weren't using the gas right or the electricity right. These are things that the landlord is not required to fix, and, and it puts a duty on, on you to take care of that because you caused the problem. You had a, a duty to not take the actions that you were taking, um, using the portions of the dwelling for their intended purposes. So if you cause a habitability issue because you were running a business out of your home and you weren't supposed to do that, things like that um, it could also lead the, lead the responsibility to fall on your shoulders to fix the issue rather than the landlord security so this is also included in that warranty of habitability uh landlord is provide is required to provide proper locks uh per california civil code section 1941.3 uh, that means deadbolts on all swinging exterior doors 
uh, not including sliding doors, of course, uh, proper locks on all the windows, however, and proper locks on all doors for ingress and egress to the community areas. So if you have a back shared back patio or something like that, or front courtyard, you also you also need to have proper locks on the door uh, to keep keep your house secure. Um, and if you don't, it's your responsibility to notify the landlord that they're not working properly. Uh, telephone jack. Obviously, this is becoming probably more and more outdated. Uh, people aren't using house phones as often anymore, but the law still requires that every dwelling be outfitted with at least one telephone jack. So domestic violence, uh, safety issues. If you are the victim of a domestic violence, you have certain rights as far as habitability is concerned. Um, so if you get a restraining order uh, or a protective order against co um, meaning like a roommate, the landlord uh, must change the locks upon written request within 24 hours of being provided a copy of the court order uh, and provide the new key to the protected tenant. Um, the landlord does not change the locks within 24 hours. The protected tenant may change the locks themselves, uh, but you must use a lock of the same or better quality than the original um, and notify the landlord of the change within 24 hours and provide the landlord with the new key. An interesting thing also is that once this protective order has been issued, uh, the landlord is no longer liable to the excluded tenant. Um, however, the excluded tenant is still liable to the landlord for rent. So what does that mean? That means when you, if the excluded tenant um, was on a lease or they, the landlord has certain contractual responsibilities to the excluded tenant. Those are wiped out. Um, the landlord doesn't have to provide them with the place to live, um, things of that nature anymore, like the lease said. However, the excluded tenant who has a restraining order against them is actually still liable to pay the landlord for rent um, in the event that the landlord's not receiving their rent, uh, the person living there is not paying, or they move out. The landlord could still go after that person who no longer is allowed to access the property for unpaid rent. So what can you do about habitability issues if you're having them in your apartment? If a landlord fails to repair habitability issues within a reasonable amount of time after written or oral notice, then the tenant may. There's a couple options. Um, repair and deduct, which means you can repair the issue or hire somebody to repair the issue and deduct the amount that you paid uh, from your next rent payment. Uh, the one limitation on this is that the amount that you pay to fix the issue cannot be in excess of one month's rent. So if your rent's $2,000 a month, you can't hire somebody for $5,000 to fix the issue. Uh, well, I guess you could, but you could only deduct one month's rent. So you'd be stuck with the, the other $3,000 bill uh, for yourself. The other option you have, if the landlord's not uh, fixing the habitability issues, uh, is to vacate the premises uh, and no longer be liable for the rent. So basically just move out and cancel the lease. Um, however, these two options come with problems. Uh, there are some concerns, I think. If you do the repair and deduct, uh, you know, the landlord, and then you don't pay the rent, the landlord can make arguments that, you know, it wasn't reasonable what you paid to fix the issue, or you didn't wait enough time for them to, to actually fix it after you gave them notice. Um, and then they could still come after you for unpaid rent. Um, and it doesn't mean you're not going to win that argument, uh, but it, it is there is a chance you're not going to win. And also just the headache of dealing with that issue, um, you know, it could backfire and it could be a real pain in the neck to deal with that. So, um, and then the issue with, with moving out again is the same thing. If you just move out and the landlord doesn't agree that the habitability issues uh, were enough to, for you to terminate the lease and move out, or they didn't have enough time to fix it, they could come after you in court uh, for unpaid rent or try to keep your security deposit. And again, you may be able to successfully argue that issue in court, but uh, you know you want to also consider the 
the headache that would come with that uh, and the possibility that maybe you didn't win, uh, which would be would be a totally separate issue. And you'd be out the money and, you know, the landlord back rent, things like that. So they're good. Pro they're good. They are good rights to have, uh, but they're, they're definitely not without their issues. Um, so what other options do you have? I think most importantly, Section 1942, which we just discussed, uh, your options with habitability issues requires the landlord to have notice of the habitability issue. So number one is when you have an issue, you need to tell your landlord. You can't just act on these things. If the landlord doesn't have notice, obviously they can't be expected to fix the problem. Uh, if you notify the landlord and they do not take action and you don't want to repair and deduct or you don't want to move out, um, your other options are to call the local health department and ask for an inspect inspection uh, or call local code enforcement and ask for an inspection. Uh, both of these options are pretty similar. Um, in some counties, they have kind of joined the inspections. If you call the health department, they're just going to tell you to call code enforcement. But either way, in my experience, they come out pretty quick. Uh, they see an issue. They will cite your landlord and give them a limited time, usually 30 or 35 days to fix the issue. Um, and after that, the landlord, if, if they don't fix the issue, they'll start accruing fines. And then actually other legal options may become available um, for you as well. If they don't fix it, you may start having the cause of action, like the ability to sue your landlord for, for these things. Um, you also have the ability to sue your landlord in small claims court. Uh, you provide proof of the condition and proof of your demand to the landlord to repair um, and show that they haven't done it. And, you know, you can get a court order or you may be able to get some compensation for that as well. And then another option is to seek a private attorney um, and ask if they will take a, the case on a contingency basis. Uh, if you don't know, a contingency basis basically means you can hire a lawyer. They'll take your case without any money up front. Um, and then they only get paid if you get paid. So, you know, sometimes they won't take the case because of that. But if the issues are severe, um, it may be pretty easy and, and it may be a really good option. And it can't hurt to ask attorney uh, if they'll take your case because they'll usually do a free consultation. And like I said, it won't cost you any money up front. So restrictions on the landlord. Um, once the habitability issue has, has been notified, or once the landlord's been notified of the habitability issue, if you look at this, they cannot demand rent, collect rent, increase rent, or issue a three-day notice to pay or quit if the, dwell is un the dwelling is untenable after under Section 1941. So that means any of the conditions we've already talked about um, are present. A public officer has inspected and notified the landlord in writing of their obligation to repair the problem. 35 days have passed since the landlord was notified and the delay is not with good cause or is without good cause. And the condition was caused by the tenant. So if you have one of these issues, you call code enforcement uh, or health inspector, they come out and they tell the landlord, you know, you need to fix this. The landlord hasn't fixed it after 35 days and you didn't cause the problem. At that point, the landlord can't demand rent uh, from you or increase your rent or even collect the rent. Even if you try to pay it, they need to they need to return it until the until the issue is fixed. So that's really important. And that's why calling code enforcement or the health inspector is a really good option uh, in these situations. And then if, if they do violate your landlord violates this um, section, they can be forced to pay actual damages between $100 uh, and $5,000 plus attorney's fees. And when you see that, it says plus attorney's fees. That's that's important also because that also makes it more likely that a private attorney would be interested in taking your case because they know that there is a, a chance for them to get paid even if the actual money you're suing for your, your landlord for is not a high dollar amount. Also, your landlord cannot retaliate against you. Um, so Civil Code Section 1942.5 makes it illegal for a landlord to retaliate against you for 180 days after you make a complaint about habitability, either orally or written. Um, 
if you notify the landlord of a bed bug infested infestation, if you make a complaint to an appropriate agency, like the health inspector or code enforcement, after they inspect or issue a citation, um, or after you file a court action or arbitration regarding habitability, or after you get an award or a court order um, from, from that uh, court action regarding habitability. So once that happens, your landlord cannot retaliate against you for at least 180 days. So what are some examples of retaliation would be the landlord attempting to evict you from the property, increasing the rent, uh, decreasing any services, meaning if they took away your access to the community swimming pool, or if they tried to, let's say they pay for the water, they provide the water, if they try to turn off your water, things like that, take away your parking spot, they can't do any of that, that would be illegal retaliation. Um, if they report you or people associated with you to an immigration authorities would also be an ex uh, example of, of retaliation. Um, or if they threaten to do any of the above, even if they don't actually do it, if they threaten to do it, then that is also retaliation. Um, they could be sued for that. And these are protections that also, just like the warranty of habitability, cannot be waived in your lease. If your landlord does retaliate against you, they can be held liable for actual damages. Um, so whatever out-of-pocket money it costs you, whether that's because you had to rent another place to live, um, you fix it yourself, if it costs you money in other ways, um, they'll be liable for that. Also punitive damages, which are basically meant to punish the landlord for their bad contact. And that can be between $100 and $2,000 for each act if they acted with fraud, oppression, or malice. Um, and attorney's fees again so that's that's really important your landlord is also prohibited from harassing you um, under california civil code section 1942 1940.2 sorry uh landlord cannot do any of the following with the intent of influencing you to move out which is violate penal code section 14 or excuse me penal code section 484 which is for fraud uh or violate penal code section 518. Uh, so if they if they commit fraud, I saw a case recently where a landlord tried to take a client's rental assistance money um, and then told them, well, the landlord took more than they should have and then told the client, I will give you the money I owe you if you move out. Um, so that would be a good example really for both. Um, and we're we're actually looking at that right now uh, that the landlord was illegal harassing our client and by committing fraud and extortion uh, with the intent of influencing the move out. Um, so it does actually happen. Uh, the landlord did that in writing. Uh, so he's probably going to have some problems with that moving forward. Um, the landlord also cannot use or threaten to use force, uh, willful threats or menacing conduct conduct. That interferes with your with your quiet enjoyment of the premises, and that would create an apprehension of harm in a reasonable person. Uh, so if they're just coming to your door, or they see you and they're threatening you, or they're saying abusive things to you, uh, that, that can be a problem. They also cannot commit um, significant intentional violations of section 1954. So, they need to enter your apartment uh, during normal business hours if they need to enter. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then again, just like the retaliation, sorry, I, I skipped a slide, but they can't threaten to report you or anybody associated with you to immigration authorities. Uh, that would be uh, illegal harassment as well. So if you go to court and you prove a violation of the section in court uh, harassment, including in small claims court, um, you are entitled to up to $2,000 for each violation. Um, however, there are a couple exceptions to the rule. A, a good faith written or oral warning given to you uh, regarding conduct that violates or might violate the lease uh, or the, the rules or the law, um, it's not considered harassment. 
Uh, and the same with an oral or written explanation of the lease uh, regulations or laws given during normal business hours is not considered harassment either. So some tips for you if you're encountering these issues. Um, create a paper trail. So while the statute says that it's sufficient to know your to, to notify your landlord of habitability issues orally, it's not really advisable. Uh, you want to do these things in writing. Um, email is okay, but written letter is better. Uh, either way, make sure you save a copy for your records. Um, and then if they send something back to you in writing, make sure you save a copy of that. And make sure you take good pictures of the conditions, whether it's an infestation, it's mold, it's a flood, it's a leak. Make sure you have pictures. Uh, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. May, hopefully your landlord is going to fix this stuff, but if they don't, you may end up in court. Um, and you want to have the evidence to present to the judge, like the pictures, the fact that you notified the landlord, whatever their response was, if they were blowing you off. Um, so you have all that in writing. That's really strong evidence when you show up to court. And remember that when you communicate with your landlord, you know, if it does end up getting to the point where things need to go to court, you know, remember that these communications are going to show up in front of a judge possibly one day. So make sure you're respectful. Obviously, be assertive, assert your rights, but you know, keep it respectful. Uh, make sure that whatever you're saying is something you would be care, uh, comfortable with a judge reading, and, and especially when they're going to end up making a decision about your life and, and whether or not you should be entitled to, to compensation. So no curse words, nothing insulting, no personal insults. Just keep it professional. This is the issue. I need it fixed. This is the law, things like that, um, and you should be good to go. So that is the end of the slideshow. Um, I'm going to, if you just give me one minute, uh, stop recording, and then I will be able to uh, answer questions.